the kind of the the war cry now is like I'm just effing done. I'm just so done. And I've heard that so many times. And so what other things have you seen in your experience that leaders or individuals are, are feeling as they come out of, you know, prolonged hyper vigilant in a lot of cases, because we're not talking acute, right? And that's the difference, yeah. right? This isn't a particular incident or anything. It's, it's, an, it's a, it's a combination, a slow burn, if you will. So what are some people, what are some signs and symptoms of things that you are experiencing a slow burn or burnout that that really can help the audience well you know the the old language for this was burnout um, but we call it cumulative stress now and, and cumulative stress is that prolonged unrelenting stress that goes on and on and on and it really is the most dangerous type of stress um, it, it's the straight type of stress that starts to impact our, our physical health as well as our mental health negatively and people have a tendency when they go through a crisis to focus on solving the crisis but we being focused on a crisis we can't solve what we have to do is really manage our way through it until the crisis really ends itself with regards to to the virus and and given that first of all for leaders who are used to solving problems i think that uh, we they've been presented with problems they can't solve but they've had to react to the byproducts of it and so, for example, and, and you know, uh, again, I have elderly parents as well. Don't, don't tell my mom I called her elderly. But, um, <laughs> you know, which um, that, that, that worry. So not only do we have this crisis where we have this responsibility for people that we're leading, but we're not immune from the crisis in our personal life that we have to uh, answer the other call to, or that we have a responsibility that uh, goes beyond in our personal life. And, and I think, um, you know, Crises have been thought as, as a sort of a sprint, and for, for many people it's been a marathon. And I think that uh, the analogy that I gave somebody was this. It's like uh, running a marathon and passing all the water tables, not picking up the glass of water to rehydrate because you don't think you have time. And, and, a, and a literally, you know, dying of thirst. And you didn't think that, you would ha that, that the, the race would go on this long. So you're like, no, I don't need that, I don't need that, I don't need that, which is really about the self-care. The other thing about leaders is, you know, I think leaders sometimes feel that they have to look after others, but they actually don't understand that modeling the self-care will encourage people to actually follow that, to be able to look after themselves, to be able to take that time away, to be able to recognize that, yeah, I have a life outside of, of this organization and responsibilities of kids and parents and, my God, now I'm teaching my kids because schools are closed and, and all those things. So. Uh, I think that what we're really seeing is that that cumulative stress, that unrelenting stress, where we're starting to see huge impacts on on sleep. Um, people either are completely exhausted and, and can't stay awake, or they're 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 so unable to sleep that, that again it just wears and wears and wears. I think um, a lot of people have sort of created some unhealthy coping habits that otherwise wouldn't have developed. We're seeing statistics that say, you know, the, the, the use of alcohol has gone up immensely. I guess the government can tell that by all the taxes they're collecting uh, from the liquor stores on it. But, uh, you know, so, so we know that that's happening. And then we also see the number of people that are presenting with um, medical issues related to some of the coping strategies um, that we've, you know, used for the last two years. So uh, we see everything from changes in some personalities. Um, a lot of people say, you know, my fuse isn't as long if, if I even have a fuse anymore. Uh, the things that used to, you know, just roll off my back now sort of really stick and sting. And I, I'm just not dealing with the people, um, my family or, or my work family, the, the way that I, that I want to or, or used to or that they're used to as well. I think the other thing is, um, you know, usually I would say leaders have an, an, eye, uh, an eye on an end goal. Um, but here we don't even know which direction the goal is and, and just when we think that we're playing down the field the right way, um, the, 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 the goal changes directions. And so this whole uncertainty has just really, really caused people to, I would say, be in this cumulative stress, unrelenting crisis. And then I think the, the final thing is that um, for, for a lot of individuals, um, the changes in, in you know, isolation and quarantine and in how we communicate, um, the reliance on Zoom, Teams, all these different uh, social media, it really has disconnected people. The time that we need to support each other most, I guess the advancement of technology has allowed us to continue doing what we're doing, but it actually has done us a disservice in that it has really disconnected people coming together 
and and being in proximity to actually receive and, and offer support and I know that many people are just saying oh I can't remember I can't wait till the day I can give a hug or get a hug or or you know feel a touch or hold a hand or handshake and you know I, I'm up in Fort McMurray doing a bunch of training right now and you walk into a room to greet people and you're like oh like what what's the what what are we doing today with regards to you know are we supposed to get this close together or are we supposed to you know bump arms or whatever so it, I think that um you know we we are creatures where routine gives us uh, safety and our routines are being completely disrupted and just as we get them set our routines are disrupted again which means that our body and brain never perceives a sense of safety so we're always in survival mode and I think that's really the biggest impact that I'm seeing man you you know what any one of those things you talked about we could unpack for an hour or days for that matter and i i think a big part of it is one the unknown biologically is something that stresses stresses us out like that's just kind of how we're wired we're we have a, a negativity bias we have a need for a locus of control which gives us a sense whether it be real a real real control or not that's up for debate but at least trying to do something about it you know if we're feeling stressed we can do problem focused strategy and those sorts of things and and the the other thing too i think jeff is that you you hit on it in that you know speaking for myself uh, and i'm curious to hear your thoughts you could compartmentalize work in a home you know what that's an office problem and you know to a certain extent i'm you know i try not to bring it home and all that other stuff and yeah that that works as a strategy a little bit but you know as both of those cups fill up you know they, they try and that 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 cross contamination is bound to happen and we're seeing this merging of work and all of those other things and so i'm curious you know, even things like, like memory, you know, uh, so many people are like, man, I can't remember a freaking thing anymore. You know, like, and, and I know for me, my mom's got dementia for crying out loud. So holo, like red flag. So it, you know, a lot of working memory is being used up by this constant vigilance and, and things like that. And so I'm curious, Jeff, we know that something's not right. So if I know what something is not right, what are some first steps that we can take to recover or, or, you know, let's assume that we know that, you know, things aren't a hundred percent. So we've kind of got that awareness phase and stage done. Yeah. What's something that we can do first step or a couple steps for ourselves personally, because, you know, we, we can't fill other people's cups up if ours is empty kind of thing. So yeah. where, where do we start? Well, I, I sort of use the lifeguard analogy. You don't jump into the water to save somebody who's going to drown you. Um, so it really sort of says, and I'll go back to, you know, a resilient leader is a, is a leader that, that leads from example and the self care example will allow the people underneath you to also care for themselves. So, so what does that look like? Well, sometimes it's just really basic, um, uh, turn off, turn off your electronic devices for a period of time, disconnect, um, during that disconnection, focus on something that doesn't draw energy away from you, but actually sort of replenishes that energy. Um, I think that maybe another factor, at least uh, where, where, where I live and where you live, it's been a brutally cold winter where mm -hmm. just getting out and going for those walks and, and now the ice on the, on the, the roads and the streets um, have really sort of blocked some of the, the basic things that we could do. Um, but I think that what we know is, you know, getting some exercise will burn off some of the stress hormones that, that are coursing through our, our veins and some of the hormonal changes that affect how we think and form memories and, and you know, uh, sort of emotional reactivity and, and sleep and appetite and all those sorts of things. I can't overemphasize how, and I hate calling it exercise, I'd like to re take that back and say, get your body in motion. Um, to, just do something about get your body in motion and we know that if you do that for you know 20 to 25 minutes a day just you know don't increase your cardiovascular don't put more strain on it but just get your body in motion it burns off those those stress hormones and, and can sort of help reset the, the next thing is um, and again you know social supports we are social creatures and we have all sorts of research now on the the effects of disconnecting on depression and anxiety and all these different things reconnect safely a reconnect to your supports and um, you know and don't necessarily share all the stresses that you're going through but you know um, share those those other aspects of life that are going on out there um, we're social beings and, and that is so important 
Um, the other part is, you know, uh, our, when we're going through stressful times, and I, I sort of say I've got my COVID-19, um, but now it's been two years, so I figure like I'm 19 times two for my weight gain. Um, you know, it's those salty, carby, fatty, you know, sugary foods that when we're stressed, we want quick energy to get us along. But what we don't realize is that we're actually sort of defeating ourselves. So I like to sort of say, you know, eat, eat garbage, you're going to feel like garbage. If you give your body what it needs, nutritional um, aspects and, and you know, um, vitamin-rich foods, that your body can use that to repair some of the damage um, that the stress is doing, the cumulative stress is doing. Don't underestimate the power of water, by the way. Stress is immensely dehydrating, so rehydrate, rehydrate, rehydrate. It helps flush out those those stress hormones. And you know what? You said something earlier, and you sounded like a psychologist. The negative brain bias. Um, I tell people, find three things a day you're grateful for, mm-hmm. and if you can't find them, create them. And so I was... Uh, texting with a client of mine today who said, you know, I found two of them and I can't find the third one. I'm going to find it. Go create it. So she said, I'm baking cookies with my kid. So she created it. And so don't wait for these things to happen. Create these things. Give yourself those opportunities to, to you know, cope with the stress and, and find the things you're grateful for and find those opportunities to find some joy. And it's like the, the saying of, you know, find the, the silver lining in the gray cloud. It's there. Sometimes we just have to be willing to look for it. Those, you know, those are some and, of the basics. And, and it's important, too, because a lot of times people are like, you know, an attitude of gratitude and woo-woo and get out in nature and all that. And they're like, bah, ain't got no time for that. Or that's like some spiritual mumbo jumbo. But yeah. I think what and sleep, right? Sleep is for the weak um, mm-hmm. and lack of sleep. Really weak. I must be really, really weak then because I really love my sleep. (laughs) You know, and and here's the thing. And and you're talking about really a whole body approach to mental wellness. It's not just about the one, you know, organ bunch of fatty tissue in your, in your cranium. It's, it's approaching it holistically and, uh, and in sleep to our point, I'm so glad that it has been getting the accolades at least recently that it really really deserves because the more science that and and all of these things are science-based that you're talking about here this isn't just like hey let's just throw something at a wall and stick this is we're talking about physiological neurological changes in your brain that have been under been happening for a couple of years and now it's not going to recover overnight so what are some other things you know like around sleep and and uh uh, how about let's just talk about sleep because again we could talk for two hours on that but what's your perspective on that well number one i think we're we're sleep starved uh, as a society i think that uh everything is go 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 i think that what that does is it generates a brain that goes 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 and and um what i find is that the busier i am during the day um, the more my brain is going to occupy me at night when my, when my body is at rest. It's sort of like, okay, now I get your attention because you've been so busy. Um, so, I, so I think that, you know, being able to pay attention to, you know, when you can't sleep, what's stopping it? So there's three really common factors that stop sleep. So number one, worrying about sleep. Um, so are you doing the countdown? Oh, I'm not going to get to sleep. How many hours do I have left? So the anxiety about not sleeping is actually one of the number one causes of poor sleep. Turn your clock around. Doesn't matter what time you wake up, fall back to sleep. Don't look at the clock. So the, the anxiety about sleep, number one, don't worry about it. You'll get as much as you need. And you've never gone without sleep your whole life. You'll eventually get it. So why are we worrying about it? Um, the next thing about sleep is really we, we're so bad at doing things that actually interfere with in in our sleep process. Um, what time we eat foods, what we consume, you know, all of those different things. And, and it's being able to say we need to sort of get into the sleep cycle, which is we prepare our body to invite sleep. And um, I really, really like the way that um, there's an author by the name of um, uh, Matthew Walker who's written a book called Why We Sleep. And I love what he says in his book. If you read this book and fall asleep, that's the ultimate compliment that you've given me. And he says, don't read this book in order. Read the chapters that you're struggling with right now. And if people knew what caffeine does to sleep and what it does to wakefulness, I think that uh, you'd start to cut down. Um, So what time you eat food um, affects your metabolism, the the amount of light that you have, the, the, the temperature of the room. 
Um, and then also, um, how many of, I'm wondering how many people listening to us are actually, um, you know, laying in bed with their phone next to them or, you know, as it buzzes and goes off and I got to say, I'm guilty of that, but I have an excuse. I'm on call 24 hours for certain <laughs> days of the week. Right. So I can always justify stuff that isn't healthy. And, um, you know, I, I wish it was that important that people need to get a hold of me 24 hours a day. It's rare, but you know, we convince ourselves that I've got to have that phone just in case and, uh, that disrupts. Why is it in there? Um, and I think also a routine, going to bed at the same time, getting up at the same time. Um, and if you don't sleep, get out of bed, go and try to reset and then go back to sleep. Don't, don't make your bed become associated with not sleeping. If you're not sleeping, get out of bed, go and reset, go wrap yourself in a blanket, find a warm place and, you know, try to bring on sleep and then go back to bed when you're ready to sleep. We really want to condition ourselves to think of, of the bed and bedroom as sort of being the place to go to sleep. And we do so many things, um, you know, by, by, you know, the hotel I'm in is like a 56 inch TV at the end of the bed, you know, so like, yeah, let's turn that on because that's really going to be good for my sleep. Um, so I, I think that it's just making some, some proper choices, choices. And, and if your sleep, you know, if you're not getting a solid, you know, good seven, eight hours of sleep, you got to ask yourself what you're doing to contribute to that because that's what you have the power over and you'll start to see changes in time um, to, to the amount of sleep. And the other part about sleep and maybe my pet peeve is we're just too quick to default to taking a pill. And I think people are confusing getting rest with getting restorative sleep. The type of sleep that you really want to get is the type that helps your body rebuild from the wear and tear and the damage that's been exerted on it that previous day from the, the time you woke up to the time that you're going to bed. And if we understood the difference between resting and restorative sleep, I think, and he, and he started to sort of see, um, you know, the, the impact on, on, on our health, on, on aging, and, and all those different things. I think we'd all really strive to get a lot more re restorative sleep. We'll live longer, we'll be happier, we uh, won't age as quickly. Um, so there's so many principles, and if you really want to find what I think is, you know, uh, a really good, easy read and really impactful is I can't think of any book better right now than Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep. Okay, that's great. We'll we'll put a link in the description for this, and I I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that. At least for me, I always thought of sleep as a uh, way to physically rest and restore. But I think now we're seeing, yeah, that's a big part of it. But in this context in particular, it's, it's a way for, you know, the brain actually flushes toxins during the evening. It consolidates memories that you talked yeah. about there. And it solves problems as well. And it, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's actually a critical part. And I have an aura ring. So it's my middle finger, so I'll be very sensitive to just showing that. But, you know, and, and, you know, there's different schools of thought on the accuracy, but at the very least, it, it just raises the awareness around, you know what, you, okay. there are some things that you can be doing. And that leads me to another uh, uh, challenge as well, Jeff, in that, you know, as you're going through the list of, of items, it can be overwhelming for people. So I'd also yeah. like to implore folks to, you don't have to be Tony Robbins in a week. You know, you just take, I would suggest, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts as a professional. I'm just, you know, I don't even play one on TV, but just pick one small thing a week or every two weeks or whatever it looks like and, and just start that incremental taking control of your life back. And is that something that you would also recommend, Jeff? Absolutely. I see people that sort of say, oh, I made a list of all the things that I need to do to get healthy again. And I got overwhelmed by the list and, you know took a nap, whatever, whatever, or, or ate a donut or whatever it was. And I'm like, hold on, what do you mean you're making a list? For me, what I put on the list is three things I need to do, two things I want to do. Only when I do those five things do I go back and revisit putting more things on the list. We, we overwhelm ourselves with lists, and guess what? Making lists is on your list of things to do, um, but you never get beyond that. So the first thing that I would say is pick really a need to do. Here's what I would say, and people confuse this all the time. A need to do is something your survival depends upon. Your sleep is something your survival depends upon. Uh, the amount of exercise you get is your survival depends upon it. And I would say that uh, food and or social interaction, your survival depends upon it. Um, the, 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 we confuse that though with the want to do's. And all of those things that we let go of the need to do's in order to accomplish the want to do's because they somehow um, give us a short-term sense of feeling good 
but they don't necessarily contribute to a long-term sense of, of well-being. So I would challenge people to sort of say, make a list, start with one thing you need to do. When you've mastered that, add a second thing you need to do and master that. Add a third thing that you need to do and master that and stick with it for about a week or two and then start to add some of those need to do's. And I think that it's about creating habits and routines. We are, as I said, um, creatures of routine and creatures of habit. And it doesn't take too long to, um, to, to add to our routine so it just becomes almost second nature. But you have to make the commitment to start. But don't make the commitment just to make a, a list that has start these things on it. Start yeah. small with just one thing on the list. Your survival depends upon it. Second thing, third thing, those are your needs. Then move to some of those wants. Uh, I, I love that. And then that also starts starts that locus of control cycle again, too, taking your power back. And, and uh, also, I think it's important, too, when you're starting... You know, words matter. Linguistics matter with regard to need or want or I'm stressed uh, uh, and framing it in, in such a way that you're f having feelings of stress. You are not stressed. And, and, and that's part of that separation that you are not your feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're experiencing these kinds of feelings. And so, again, we could you know, talk all night about just linguistics and words matter and, and how your subconscious is. It's literal. If you say you need it. Yeah. That's that's what your subconscious says. And well, would, you, I, would you agree? I, yeah, I love this quote, which is whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you will be right. It really is the power of what you tell yourself about a situation or or your commitment to to doing those things on the list will determine actually whether or not you do it. Um, nothing else. So people feel like the world is so out of control. And what they don't realize is that they've given up so much control because of what they tell themselves and you know again sort of that old you know winston churchill you know we have we have met the enemy and he is us and that really is what we tell ourselves is what will defeat us but what we tell ourselves will also um help us win this battle and get through and, and it is that 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 attitude that we bring um, that really does make the difference. We're waiting for the world to change. Well, guess what? You have the power to change your attitude about the world in some small way, and that will change your experience of the world. Will the change that will change that commitment to that thing you need to do, and so recognize and seize and, and really grasp onto what is within your control. It's far more than you're than you're than you're than perhaps you're telling yourself right now.